You know, if you've been watching the news this week, maybe you're a little bit like me and you think, what in the world is going on around here? It seems like there's a, another tragic uh, event almost daily the last week or two. And you, 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 you hear like lots of different voices, and these voices, it, it feels like, are, are seeking to cast blame or maybe provide easy answers for, for what is going on in our, our world, in our country right now. From either side of the political aisle, it feels like there's, there's fingers pointed, there's, there's blame placed, there's a responsibility not taken. And as I've just sat back in... in listened and watched, the thing that is in my heart and mind is they're all missing it. The answers that are being provided are, are, I feel, largely unhelpful. Because the real question, I think, is what is driving people to do these things? How does someone get to a point where they are just so angry, upset, desperate, depressed, despairing that they want to harm others in such a way? I think that's a more important question. And what is, what is the cause of that? And months ago, I, I started planning for this sermon series I was excited about. I had no idea what was going to happen. But I think Scripture provides us with a framework for understanding what is going on in our world and, and hope in the face of it. In the book we're going to be looking at this summer, in chapter 3, verse 11, Ecclesiastes, the author says this, he has made everything beautiful in its time. And then he says, also, he has put eternity into man's heart. He has put eternity into man's heart. And I think this verse helps us understand what is ailing us, because we live in a culture that, that actually does not recognize God for the most part. It doesn't recognize that there is a, a transcendent uh, purpose or meaning, actually there's, there's narratives that they say they're deconstructing grand narratives because they think those are no good, they want to throw them out, and so we live in a time and a place where people have been unmoored from what anchored them for so long, and we have told and raised generations of people to think that, that there is nothing bigger than them. That meaning and purpose is to be derived from them and their own self-fulfillment, whatever that means. And yet, the Scriptures tell us that that's not the way we are created. They say, God has put eternity in our hearts. And so I think, is it any wonder that there is tragedy after tragedy after tragedy when we have people who have, been, who have eternity in their hearts... And they've been told eternity doesn't even exist. We have, we have people and they're living desperate, depressed. That drives them to do terrible things. And even before, like the last couple weeks, even before COVID came, there was a noted slide in overall mental health in the United States. There was an uptick in depression. There was an uptick in substance abuse. All, all, I think, circulating around this same reason. We have cut loose from what the Scripture says. We have cut loose from, from true meaning and true purpose and have been set loose to just find our own. And people are finding that it is very wanting. And friends, that's what the book of Ecclesiastes is about. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn with me there to the book of Ecclesiastes. It's in the Old Testament. We had been in Luke 
uh, for, for, I counted, 54 weeks. We did 54 Sundays in, in Luke. We have looked at Genesis. This, this summer we are going to be in the book of Ecclesiastes. It is a shorter 12-chapter Old Testament wisdom book. We don't know exactly when it was written because we don't know exactly who wrote it. Some people think Solomon wrote it. If Solomon wrote it, it was probably written about 900 to 1,000 years before Jesus came on the scene, so about 3,000 years ago, um, we would say. But Ecclesiastes, it's in, if, if you want to look it up in the Pew Bible in front of you, it's on page 553 in the little black Bible that looks like that. And if you don't have one, I would just invite you to take that one with you because we believe this book provides the answers that we are all searching for. It provides a knowledge of the one for whom our hearts were made. And so if you don't have a Bible, I just invite you to take that one with you, read it. Pastor Matt, who was up here doing communion, he he put together a Bible reading plan. looks like this. We're actually reading Ecclesiastes right now. Um, one chapter a day. It's really doable, really nice. I know many of you use it. It's, it's out there. It's also online. We also have one other thing I'd tell you about. We have, uh, back at the Welcome Center, we have an ESV Scripture Journal. If you like this, you want to write notes, we have a number of these back there, so you can pick one of those up back there. But Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1 to 18 is our text for the morning. It'll also be on the screen. It says this, The words of the preacher... The son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuit the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already. In the ages before us, there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Verse 12, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun. Behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is but a striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. You read that and you're like, wow, that was happy. Goes right along with the overcast, rainy June Sunday morning, doesn't it? But you read that, and that could be written by someone today. Could be written by someone struggling with meaning and purpose in in our day and age. And so we're going to look first this morning at the problem that Ecclesiastes chapter 1 brings up, and actually the book brings up the problem has to do with meaninglessness and, and purpose in life. Then we're going to look at the solution because here's, here's the deal. This, what we've just read, is the right and natural response of every person who doesn't know Jesus. Not that they live this way, but if they really thought about it, this is where their heart should be. They should look around and they should be overwhelmed with the meaninglessness that we find. But we as followers of Jesus, we know something different. 
So my hope for this whole series is not that this, it's a downer. It's, there's, there's some tough downer stuff in the book, but that we are able as Christians to see beyond that and by contrast to know the great hope that we have. So we're going to look at the solution this morning as well. And then I want to spend a few, a few moments with you thinking, what does this mean for us this week? So the problem, a solution to that problem, and then what do we do with that? So here's, here's the problem that Ecclesiastes brings up. And, and each one of these words, I think, is important, and I want to look at them and define them. They come out of the text. But what, what the author of Ecclesiastes is saying, basically, is life under the sun, and that's an important phrase, under the sun, life under the sun, comes first out of verse 3 of chapter 1, life under the sun is meaningless. This is his contention. Life under the sun is meaningless. When he sits back and he evaluates, life under the sun is meaningless. And, and you, you have to understand a couple things if you're going to understand Ecclesiastes. And when we come to the Bible, we should, you know, you, you observe it. You look at it. What's there? What, what, what kinds of things are there? And this might be, seem like a, a silly kind of thing that I'm bringing up, but it's vitally important if we're going to understand the message and the way the author has put this book together. Look what he says in verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. That's why some people think this is Solomon writing. We don't know for sure if it's Solomon. The son of David could mean grandson of David, great-grandson of David. They would use son of David kind of in that way. Jesus was even called the son of David, you know, a thousand, a thousand years after David lived. So we don't know for sure if this is Solomon. But it says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, verse 2, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And here's the thing I want you to notice, is that this is one person speaking of another person. We call that the third person. If I'm speaking of someone else, I'm speaking in the third person. And that's what we have here. We have a person, a narrator, and in verses 1 to 11, they are giving a summation of the message of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. They're telling us what he said. You think, well, that's exciting. Look at verse 12, because there's a change. And this is what you have to see, verse 12. It goes from one person speaking of another to a person speaking of themselves. Verse 12, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem. Do you see, you see the change there? It goes from the third person to the first person. So what we have in Ecclesiastes is we actually have two voices. We have an introduction, verses 1 to 11, of chapter 1, as kind of a summary statement of what is coming in the book, the general teaching of Ecclesiastes. Then we have the large teaching section. The, the vast majority of the book is verses 12 of chapter 1 through 12, 7, that's all in the first person. He's speaking I, I, I. And then in 12, 7, 12, 8, right in that, that area, you have it resuming going to the third person. So here's, here's what you have. You have the central main teaching portion of the book. You have the introduction. And on the end, and this is, this is I'm not going to go there this morning, but this is what we have to remember. On the end, in chapter 12, you have the interpretation of the thing. Because in the middle teaching section, you have this like depressing, like life under the sun, which I'm going to talk about. And in the end, in chapter 12, the author comes back and he interprets that through us through the lens of life not under the sun. Why life isn't in fact meaningless after all. So that's important for us to understand as, as we are looking at this. And, and then the next thing that we have to know is what is life under the sun? Verse 3, he introduces this idea of life under the sun. He also says in, in verse 9, there is nothing new under the sun. And in verse 14 of chapter 1, he says, I've seen everything that is done under the sun. So this under the sun idea is important for him. And this is what I think he means as you look at the book as a whole. Life under the sun is life without reference to God. 
is life lived with just the physical, material world, the here and now, what we can see, what we can feel in view. That's what life under the sun is in Ecclesiastes. And to go back to what I started with, this is where so many in our world are living. They're living life and they're living it under the sun without reference to God, disconnected from Him and and the transcendence and the meaning and the purpose they were made for. They're living life under the sun without reference to God. And he says, that kind of life is meaningless. Verse 2, vanity of vanities. And this is an important word. If you're going to look at Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities. Says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. He uses it five times in that one verse. And he's going to use it again and again. Vanity of vanities. Vanity of vanities. That, that means meaningless. The, the literal word has to do with breath. It has to do with um, uh, things that don't last. Sometimes it's used for idols. But vanity of vanities, something that does not last. All is vanity. And then he asks, I think, Maybe the most important question of the book, what does man gain? What do we gain? Now, this isn't just men. This is mankind. What do people gain by all the toil at which they toil under the sun? This is the question that just hangs in the air. And I think this is the question that, that is, is driving depression and despair. What, what, what good is all of this stuff if at the end of the day it... All goes back in the box, right? There's that saying, at the end of life, all the, all the pieces of the, the, the game go back in the box. What's the point of all of this? What does man gain? It's meaningless. And then he's going to flesh this out for us. Verse 4, a generation goes, a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. One of the reasons that life under the sun is meaningless is because of impermanence. We are in the season, maybe you've gone to some of these, of graduations. We were at one last night. It was awesome. They had a pork chop on a stick. I was very awesomely surprised. It was delicious, as they always are. Right? You go and you see, you see the, uh, the, the pictures. There's a progression. You know, from, from when they were born, their kindergarten pictures, all the way up. I mean, this was, this was a big strapping dude last night. I mean, way bigger than me, right? He would eat me for lunch if, if, if he so desired. And you just see, like, little baby, big, strong man, and everything in between. Like, wow. Guess what? Next year, there's going to be a new crop of seniors. And the year after that, there's going to be a new crop of seniors. And the year after that, there's going to be a new, a new, a new group. And the year after that, a new group. My, my, my oldest daughter, she told me this week, she's graduating with the class of 2030. And I'll buckle up, Dad. <laughs> I'm, not ready, I'm not ready for that. I look back, I graduated, you know, some of you are going to think, wow, he's old. And some of you are going to think, wow, he's just a baby. But 20, or 2001... We like to say we were the class of the new millennium. My wife graduated 2000. She thinks she was the class of the new millennium. But there's an argument there because nobody starts counting at zero. Let's be real. Um, (laughs) Sorry, honey. That goes back a long way. (laughs) I'm going to be in big trouble. I already am. All right. Let's pray. (laughs) But, but... But you look, you look at life and you think, man, where, for, for me, where did, where did 21, 22 years since high school go? And where have 10 years of my daughter's life gone? And I have pictures and I know where they've gone, but they go so fast. And what the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying is, like, they go fast and you do stuff, and you exert energy, and you graduate, and you get married, and you have children, and, and all of these things happen, and then at the end, you die. And what is left? A generation comes, a generation goes, but the earth remains forever. It seems that there's not this lasting impact. This goes back to, to the very beginning, because God didn't make it to be this way. He made us to fill the earth and subdue it. 
Genesis chapter 1, but in Genesis chapter 3, man sinned and God said to Adam, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you and shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This is what Ecclesiastes author is picking up. A generation comes, generation goes. The earth remains forever. Things aren't permanent. He says in, in verses 5 and following, he talks about the sun and the cycle of, of the sun. The sun comes up, the sun goes down, and it always seems to go that way. Verse 6, the wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. They didn't know about, they, at the time they wrote this, they didn't know about the universe and the solar system and all the things we know about but we, that we know today. We know all this is, is true. This is how it works. The sun rises, the sun sets. The wind blows, and it comes back. Verse 7, all the streams run to the sea. They didn't know about the water cycle, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. Like, no, nothing seems to be full. Things come around. The, it, it, the same things always are happening. Verse 8, all things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Not, not only is the earth cyclical and from that we can think that man like nothing is changing and we are impermanent while the earth is permanent but but ourselves there's this this thing inside of us the eye is not satisfied nor the ear filled you know you see something wonderful or beautiful and this is not what you do <laughs> you're like well i checked that one off the list i never want to see that again go see the mountains or a beautiful beach or, or you, you, hear, you hear an amazing like, piece of music. You're like, well, I heard it once and I never want to hear it again. What do you do? You put the thing on repeat. Why? Because your ear is never satisfied. And, and you put posters up. If you can't be on the beach where you go, you take pictures and you put posters up. Why? Because your heart just wants to soak more of it in. They're not satisfied. They're never filled. There's this longing, this desire for, for, for more in all of these things because, because we can never fill these things because the earth is in ourselves. We're so impermanent. It goes back to verse 2. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What do we gain from all the toil under the sun. I just, I just look out and you think, people, you all, you have various professions. We have teachers and bankers and doctors and dentists and people who work in factories. And, you know, we, we have so many people and you think, like, you're, you're, our, our jobs, they're, they're cyclical and they're repetitive. And, and you could think, man, what is the point? Just, just got done with school, and then in August or September, we're going to get a new class, and then the year after that, there's going to be another class and another class, and, and it's, it's unending. In the writer of Ecclesiastes, he says, man, this is under, life under the sun, it looks like we're not making any progress. When you hit verse 12, he introduces a new, a new reason, I think, where, why life seems like it's meaningless. Because no matter how hard we try, we can't fix what ails the world. What he says, verse 14, I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and is striving after wind. Verse 15, what is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. Not only are we impermanent, temporary, like a vapor, but our best efforts at making the world better, at straightening what is crooked, never seem to work out, right? Even, even the best laid plans, the best political policy is going to have unintended consequences that rebound and, and make havoc somewhere else. We fix this problem, but this one creeps up. And then we fix that one, and that one creeps up. This thing is hopelessly broken, and we can pour our time and our effort into it, but it will never be perfect. We'll never be able to straighten out what is crooked. And so life is vanity under the sun. Verse 18, 
He comes around and he says, In much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases sorrow increases knowledge. One way the ancients especially had, they would, they would think about knowledge and wisdom, and with enough knowledge or wisdom, maybe we can conquer the world, we can change things. We think the same way. We just need to know more. Look what he says. All that does is create more heartache. The more you know, guess what? The more you know what you don't know. And the more you know, the more, the more stuff you are aware of. And you know what they say, ignorance is bliss. Because if I don't know about it, I don't have to be worried about it. I don't have to, I don't know, have to know how, how close to the, the edge I got. So for these reasons, because of impermanence in the world, because of the brokenness of the world, because more knowledge just increases our sorrow and our vexation, it doesn't fix the problem, the writer of Ecclesiastes says, life under the sun, life lived without reference to God, it is meaningless when you step back from it. And I would submit that this is where many in our world live. People who are driven to do desperate things are driven there because they have an ache inside of them. They were made for the infinite God. God has put eternity in their hearts, and yet they're living under the sun. Life under the sun is meaningless, says the writer of Ecclesiastes. But the good news for us is this, is that we do not have to live under the sun. We don't have to live without reference to God. We don't have to live disconnected from our Creator. We don't have to live with the ache that, that the people in our world live with because we know something and we know someone who fills that in for us. His name is Jesus. And Jesus restores meaning and purpose to life. See, all that was disconnected back in Genesis chapter 3, but Jesus came, as we just finished in the Gospel of Luke, He came to bring God's freedom and God's favor to us. And one of the ways he does that is by restoring meaning and purpose to our lives, by reconnecting us to that which we were made for, to God himself and to what he's doing. Jesus restores meaning to life. And so we don't have to live depressed. We don't have to, when, when you read Ecclesiastes, you think, man, this is sad. It is sad. But it's not us. If you know Jesus, it's not you because He restores meaning to our lives. It's like that, little, like that little yellow plant there that we have, a little yellow flower in the desert. It doesn't take away the brokenness of the world, the desert, the dryness of life, but there's life there. Jesus restores meaning to life. I, 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 and this only works in English. I won't pretend that this works in Hebrew. I wish it did. But, um, and this isn't an original thought for me. But if you go back to the question of chapter 1, verse 3, where he says, what does man gain by all the toil which he toils under the sun without reference to God? You can change that because in English we have, we have a homo, homophone, right? Sun, S-U-N, the big, the big star. But then we have the sun, Capital S O N. Jesus, Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun, under Jesus? If you change the question, the answer is different. Rather than it being meaningless, there is great meaning and purpose for us, for our lives, no matter what we do, no matter what we invest our time in, no matter no matter if we see how how things are changed permanently or made better, whether it will it doesn't, doesn't matter. Life under the sun, under Jesus, if we live connected to Him, our lives can have great meaning and great purpose. He says in verse 4, in verse 11, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. And in verse 11, he says, there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. I don't even remember. I don't know if you were like this. This is sad, and I'm an ingrate, uh, but I don't, rem- I, don't, I don't know off the top of my head the names of my great-grandparents, right? Without my great-grandparents, I wouldn't be here today, and I'm such a thankless uh, punk that I don't even know their names off the top of my head. 
This is what he's talking about. There is no remembrance of former things. You know what that tells me? Probably in three or four generations, no one's going to remember my name either. That's under the sun, but look, look, at what, look at what this says. This is under Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.10. Look what the Apostle Paul says. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he's done in the body, whether good or evil. This is actually, not this verse in particular, but this is the concept there that the author of Ecclesiastes ends with in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Life under the sun is not meaningless. One of the reasons is because there is a God in heaven and He is watching and He knows. And 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, He doesn't just forget. So when we go and we live lives lived unto Christ, lives of sacrifice and service, not big or flashy, lives that nobody's going to write a book about, maybe, but lives that have a relationship to Him. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, He sees, He remembers, and it is going to go on for eternity. You're either going to be, you're going to be rewarded for that. And that goes if you are, uh, you know, no matter what you do, whether it's big, worldly speaking, small worldly speaking, whether you make a lot of money, whether you make a little bit of money, whether, whether you, you, you touch a lot of lives that you can tell on a daily basis or whether you, you, know, you just interact with a few people or whether you stay home with the kids or, or, or whatever you do, if it's done unto Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, each one may receive what is due for what they have done in the body. So life under the sun, it all goes back in the box. Life under the sun, Jesus, He will reward you he is watching. He knows. And in that, He is restoring meaning to our lives. The other thing I think we see, Jesus restores meaning, but He also just restores. You know, what, you watch what's going on in, in our country, in our world, and it's like, my goodness, can anyone fix this? The answer is, not anyone that's holding office right now. No one elected to the United States government is going to fix what is crooked because it's too broken and it lies too deep. But, but the good news is Jesus came and, and uh, in Romans, I, I love these verses in Romans, Romans chapter 8, they would be worth meditating on. Look what he says, for the creation was subjected to futility or meaninglessness. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that, and listen to these words, the creation itself, the creation that under the sun, that is broken, is crooked, can't be made straight, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. See, Jesus restores meaning to our lives. And Jesus would, come, would love to come and restore meaning to the lives of every person who feels that they, they don't have meaning, they don't have purpose. What are they living for? It's just repetitive. It's nine to five. They're living, they're living for the weekend or they're living for uh, their vacation or you're living for retirement. You're just, you're just trying, to, trying to get through the day because you don't know why you're here. And Jesus comes and he says, man, I've, I've given you meaning, purpose. I see you. I'm going to reward you. And guess what? All this brokenness that tears you up, I'm going to wipe it away one day. Life under the sun is meaningless. Jesus restores meaning to life. And so I think as we, we just begin our study of Ecclesiastes, I think this is for me, let Jesus restore or give our lives meaning. You can de derive meaning and purpose from so many things. In the book of Ecclesiastes, he's going he's gonna to take a pin and he's going to pop each one of those things for us. <laughs> it's kind of brutal. 
but we can let Jesus give our lives meaning. Let Jesus give our lives meaning. Here's the question. What are we going to live under? Are we going to live under the Son without reference to God? Or are we going to live under the Son who came and offered Himself as a sacrifice? Who's, who, before whom we're going to stand in judgment and the one who is going to one day wipe it all clean. He's going to restore it. He's going to renew it. He's going to perfect it. The, the, the place that our hearts long for, it's going to be here. But only by Him and only by His power. So when we get up tomorrow, go back to work, which one is it going to be? Going to live under the sun without reference to God. You're going to live under the sun with every moment as unto Him, as an act of worship and offering to Him. Second Corinthians again. Each one will receive what is due for what they've done in the body. I don't think he means it like how big it is. He means who it's pointed towards. One thing. Second thing, I think as we, we contemplate this, this should give us great compassion. And people who have perpetrated evil things, that's terrible. And it, it, it's, it's unspeakable and they're responsible. And this isn't to like wipe any of that away, but anyone living under the sun without reference to God, I think should have our compassion. We know Jesus. We have a relationship with the God of the universe. People who don't, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. When they think about their lives, it's like, well, their answer inevitably ought to be, well, none of this makes any difference. So as we go, we ought to have compassion on people living under the sun. Last thing. When we see the brokenness of the world, whatever that brokenness looks like, and we, we understand that, man, I can't fix it. I do my best day in and day out, but I, I'm just so small and so finite, I can't fix it. We can either, we can either sink into despair and depression and anxiety like, like so many, or I think it can create a hunger in us. It can create a desire for something better, for what Romans chapter 8, verse 21 says, the day when creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay or corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We don't have to rejoice in this, but it can create a hunger for us for the day when Jesus is going to come and he's going to wipe it all away. And Revelation 21 says, there will be no more crying, tears, pain. The former way of things will be gone. Here's the question. Who are we going to live under? Are we going to live under the sun? Because the inevitable outcome of that is meaninglessness, despair, just trying to get through life. Make it to the weekend, make it to a vacation, make it to retirement. And what's after retirement? Are we going to live under the sun? Who wants to give meaning and purpose to even the small things of our lives? Live to Him. So Lord, that's, that's my prayer. That each one of us who know you, we would choose to follow you that we would live our lives unto you as our Savior, as our Creator, as our strength, 
as the one that we can glorify with everything that we do. Lord, let us, let us live that way. Lord, let our lives be lighthouses of hope, of grace and truth in a world that is so broken, Lord, and so desperately needs the hope that you offer, and yet turns away from it over and over again. Lord, I pray that you would reach out through us to the people you put in our lives. Lord, and through us, you would, you would bring the gospel, and through the gospel, you would bring meaning and purpose to the lives of people who are just floundering without it. So, Lord, we pray this in your name. Amen.